the physics of Aristotle is transcribed 4th century BC. The principal ideas are to know a thing involves understanding his first uh, understanding first principles. Matter is potentiality, form is actuality. To each form there corresponds a special matter. There are four types of causes. The material cause, which is matter. The formal cause, which is the kind. The final cause, which is the purpose. The efficient cause, that which initiates change. In addition, change and spontaneity are kinds of causes. Nature, defined as a principle of motion and change, is a cause that operates for a purpose. The infinite is potential, never actual. Place is the innermost motion is boundary of what contains. Time is the n- number of motions in respect to before and after. There are three kinds of change, qualitative, quantitative and local. There must be an unmoved mover by which eternal rotary motion imparts motion to all things. In modern times, with the growth of natural science, most of the topics treated by Aristotle in this work would be classified as metaphysics. The collection of treaties bearing that name has come to stand for any speculative question concerning first principles, and in that light the topics of the physics are closer to metaphysics than to modern questions of physics. Aristotle begins by considering the number and character of the first principles of nature, and he goes on to argue against Parmenides' speculative theories. Nevertheless, the con- topics here consider do consider first principles of the physical world, and the work is still a classic in its grasp of issues fundamental to all physical inquiry. Book 1 opens by stating that it is first principles which we must come to know, to know a thing means to grasp its first principles and to have carried the analysis out to the simplest elements. We proceed from things more obvious and knowable to us and move to those principles more clear and knowable by nature. Our first question is to ask whether the first principles involved are one or more than one. As a physicist, Aristotle takes it for granted that the things which exist by nature are either all or some of them in motion. Speculative theories are to the contrary with the idea of being as one and motionless. He dismisses. One of the famous questions of the physics now begins to develop. Whether there is an actual infinite in the category of quantity. The infinite qua infinite Aristotle firmly believed is unknowable and it is primarily this epistemological difficulty which plagues Aristotle about the infinite. The principles of physical nature cannot be either one or innumerable. A finite number is sufficient and an infinite number would be unknowable. One of the famous questions of the physics The question is, how can we know the unknowable? That was something that was taken up by Hegel, but anyway, I shall stick with this for now. In dealing with coming into being and change, Aristotle uses potentiality and actuality as explanatory concepts. What desires form is matter. Matter is the origin of potentiality and form the symbol of actuality. Matter, Aristotle defines as the primary substratum of each thing from which it comes to be without qualification and which persists in the result. Nature, Aristotle defines as a source or cause of being moved and of being at rest in that to which it belongs primarily, but no thing has in itself the source of its own production. In Book 2 we begin again on the basic problems of physics, Form is more nearly nature than matter, for a thing is more properly said to be when it has attained fulfilment, fully formed, than when it exists potentially. However, we also speak of a thing's nature as being manifest in the process of growth 
by which its nature is attained. Here Aristotle makes pauses to make his famous distinction between physics and mathematics. Physical objects contain surfaces, volumes, lines, points, which is the subject matter of mathematics, but the mathematician does not treat them as the limits of the physical body. He separates them, for in thought they are separable from motion. The objects of physics are less separable than those of mathematics. Such things are neither independent of matter nor definable in terms of matter only. Of course, matter is a relative term. To each form there corresponds a special matter. Here Aristotle changes topics again, this time to define the now famous four types of causes. 1. That out of which a thing comes to be, the matter or material cause. 2. The form or the archetype, the formal cause. 3. The end or purpose, the final cause and four, the primary source of change or coming to rest, the efficient cause. And as is not generally known, Aristotle adds to these change, adds to these change and spontaneity, both of which must be counted as causes. This addition is often overlooked because these latter two causes are not amenable to knowledge, and yet any complete account must include them. Chance is unstable and is thus inscrutable to man. Nature belongs to the class of causes which acts for the sake of something, and thus it is amenable to intelligence. Those things that are natural, which by a continuous movement originated by an internal principle, arrive at some completion. Nature is a cause, a cause that operates for a purpose. Nature is to be defined as a principle of motion and change, the fulfilment of what exists potentially, insofar as it exists, potentially, is motion, and it is not absurd that the actualization of one thing should be in another. In Book 3, Aristotle turns to the problem of the existence of an infinite, and he readily admits that many contradictions result, whether we suppose it to exist or not. Is there a sensible magnitude which is infinite? This is the physicist's problem. Aristotle begins by assuming that number is a no numberable quality, quantity rather. Having concluded that sensible infinite cannot exist actually, Aristotle goes on to discuss whether it might have potential existence. The infinite has turned out to be the contrary of what is said to be. The infinite is potential, never actual. The, its infinity is not a permanent actuality, but consists in a process of coming to be like time and the number of time. Place is the concept under consideration of Book 4. Now, if place is what primarily contains each body, it would be a limit. The place of a thing would be its form, but the place of a thing is neither a part nor a state of it, but is separable from it and place would not have been thought of if there had not been a special kind of motion, namely that with, with respect to place. Aristotle concludes that the innermost motionless boundary of what contains is place. Furthermore, places are coincident with things, for boundaries are coincident with things and also with places. After place, Aristotle begins his famous consideration of time. Aristotle considers it evident that time is not movement, nor is it independent of movement. <laughs> we perceive movement and time together. Time, he concludes, is just this. The number of motion in respect to before and after. Time, then, is a kind of number, just as motion is a perpetual succession so also is time. Time and movement define each other. It is obvious then that things which always are cannot be in time, since time by its nature is the cause of decay, because change removes what now is. Yet since time is the measure of motion, it is also indirectly the measure of rest. And in conclusion we ask, Will time fail? Surely not. If motion always exists, 
Time has being in the same way that motion does. Every change and everything that moves is in time. Book 5 Aristotle begins to move the argument for motion toward the motionless. The goal of motion, he insists, is really immovability. Only change from subject to subject is motion, and there are three kinds of change, qualitative, quantitative, local. In respect to substance, there is no motion, because substance has no contrary among things that are. Change is not a subject. There must be a substratum underlying all processes of becoming and changing. Book 7 begins by asserting that everything that exists is in motion and must be moved by something. But this series cannot go on to infinity. Therefore, the series must come to an end. And there must be a first movement and a first moved. Here is Aristotle's argument for the existence of an unmoved mover from the very nature of motion itself. A great deal of the force of the argument depend, derives from the requirements of Aristotelian knowledge. Knowing and understanding imply that the intellect has reached a state of rest and has come to a standstill. And this can be so only if the mind can find a satisfactory explanation for the origin of motion. Nevertheless, time is uncreated and motion is eternal. There must always be time. It is clear that there never was a time when there was not motion and that the time will never come when motion will not be present. And there must be three things. The moved, the movement and the instrument of motion. But the series must stop somewhere, since the kinds of motion are limited, so there will be an end to the series. Consequently, the first thing that is in motion will derive its motion either from something that is at rest or is from itself. But that which is in its itself, that, but that which is itself independently a cause, is always prior as a cause, and this argues for the source of motion in something itself at rest. That which Im primarily imparts motion is itself unmoved. There must necessarily be some such thing which, while it has the capacity of moving, something else, while it has the capacity of moving something else, is itself unmoved and exempt from all change. This is the crux of Aristotle's argument. Motion, then, being eternal, that which first causes the movement will also be eternal. It is sufficient, he feels, to assume only one movement, the first of unmoved things, and this will be eternal and the principle of motion to everything else. The first movement must be something that is one and eternal. And if the first principle is permanent, the universe must also be permanent, since it is continuous with the first principle. However, motion is of two kinds. Some things are moved by an eternal unmoved movement and are therefore always in motion. Other things are moved by an agent itself in motion and changing, and so they too change their motion. Locomotion, Aristotle feels, is the primary motion. Yet it is possible that there should be an infinite motion that is single and continuous. This motion is rotary motion, since rectilinear motion cannot be continuous. There cannot be a continuous rectilinear motion that is eternal. On the other hand, in motion on a circular line we find singleness and continuity. Rotation is the primary locomotion. Every locomotion is either rotary or rectilinear, or a compound of the two. Rotary motion can be eternal, and thus it is prior as motion. Aristotle concludes that there is always... Aristotle concludes that there was always, always was motion and always will be motion throughout all time. The first movement of this eternal motion is unmoved and rotatory, rotary motion is unmoved. <sighs> I'll start again. 
the first movement of this eternal motion is unmoved and rotation, rotary motion is alone, can be eternal and is primary. If the series comes to an end, a point is reached at which motion is imparted by something that is unmoved. The only continuous motion then is that which is caused by the unmoved mover and such a first unmoved mover cannot have any magnitude, is indivisible and without parts. Aristotle's conclusion to the physics is really only an introduction to the repetition and extension of some of the arguments later to appear in the book of editor writings entitled The Metaphysics. Yet in this preliminary, preliminary book, most of the crucial concepts are most of the crucial concepts concerning physical nature are given in a basic definition. The first principles of physics have been enumerated and defined. All that lies beyond physics is metaphysics. The end. <sighs> I fumbled reading from my notes again. But then I make it, I tend to start in the afternoon while the light starts dimming. And then it gets dark. I should know better really. Anyway. I hope you find this of some use. Aristotle's physics in 15 minutes.